one thing that maybe is worth saying up front is architecture should probably not be about architecture. Hmm. So architecture is, you know, is intended to be about something else, right? So the tabernacle is not about the tabernacle. It's about God's way, mm. right? And he describes that way to us mm. in many different ways. And that building is one way in which he describes it to us. Ever walk into a space and just go, ah, it feels like heaven. The importance of design and the beautification of community spaces can often get lost in the American ethic of utilitarianism, which is, is it useful and is it cost effective? But how can the thoughtful design of space, and maybe even a little bit of extravagance, be used to facilitate a better worship experience? To answer these questions, we are having a disquisition with Andrew Von Maurer, a professor of architecture at Andrews University, on the topic of church design and the history of sacred space. If you're not already following us on Facebook and Instagram, you can find us at the handle at AdventNext. Joining me as my co-host is Max Aka, and I'm your host, Kendra Arsenal, and this is Advent Next. I wasn't really thinking about architecture growing up. Mm. It wasn't something that was on my mind. Um, I grew up in Germany. Mm-hmm. And my mother's German, my father's American, and we would go to these old cities, and I, you know, my dad would point to these cathedrals and say, look at the cathedral kids. And, you know, so you're kind of growing up with a certain architectural environment, but taking it for granted also. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a, I grew up uh, in Germany and ended up going to college in the 90s, which is when there was a high rise boom in Frankfurt, Germany, which is, I grew up near there. And uh, my mother started thinking about, well, what should this son of mine do (laughs) with his life? And she knew I liked to draw. So she just sort of suggested architecture. And it wasn't something that I ever had thought about really, but different people grew up differently in their relationship to architecture. So for example, some people really grew up with maybe a more construction emphasis and their maybe their parents are builders or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, That wasn't my case. My father was uh, from a family where you had to be a lawyer or a doc or a doctor, but he, mm-hmm. uh, I think, wanted to be an architect or a musician. Those were like his passions, mm-hmm. and so the way that he thought about architecture was more like from an artistic standpoint. Mm-hmm. And uh, especially growing up in Germany, seeing these old uh, cathedrals and old uh, palaces and so on. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's a famous quote by a German poet, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who said, uh, architecture is like frozen music. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's in a way my sort of starting point for becoming interested in architecture, more right. from sort of that sort of angle. And it's interesting because I think Germany and America has different design philosophies. I mean, all of Europe really coming from kind of this classic medievalism. Um, in your kind of meditations between God and architecture, like America has like a different kind of ethic, more utilitarian ethic, you know, mm. is it useful and uh, and there's not a lot, lot of place for design. Like, does God care about design? Like, is that something that you have found is important to him or is he more on the utilitarian side? Yeah, so I definitely, of course, I'm biased, <laughs> but I definitely think that God cares about design. He's, mm. des- he's the ultimate designer, right? He's the ultimate architect. And, you know, the word architect in English comes from the Greek architecton, which basically means master builder. Mm. And, and uh, of course, in Scripture, it also says that Jesus grew up with a builder as a father. And so he grew up as a builder, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And, and um, of course, there's so many different analogies to God being a master architect of mm-hmm. our lives and of creation and so on. I like to think about uh, the act of creation also of, of Adam and this idea of being able to, you know, God being able to look at the dust, mm. imagining everything about perfect humanity, and then making that first person, right? And and in a way, he's given us an analogous sort of power. We have the ability to look at a piece of dirt, a piece of land, and imagine something, and by his grace... Mostly food. <laughs> <laughs> making amazing places for people, and right. so uh, for people to thrive in, and so yeah. on. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, there's a lot of reasons that I think archi- uh, God cares about architecture. Um, you know, his son, he chose his son to grow up as a builder. Yeah. He could have chosen anything. He could have chosen like a shepherd or, you know, a priest or somebody, you know, a vintner, a farmer, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, he, you know, he chose for him to grow up 
in this kind of making scenario where he's making things still mm. and being a steward of the things that he has to make and the steward of the relationships of the pe- with the people that he has to make things for. Mm. And, um, and at the same time, um, of course, there's so much evidence for his care about design, say in the Old Testament about the tabernacle, yeah. you know, and, and, and his willingness to fill Bezalel um, who was the sort of chief artisan of the tabernacle with the Holy Spirit. And as far as I know, that's the first time in scripture that somebody is described to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And, 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 and he's filled with the Holy Spirit in order to be able to do all of these things and to design the artifacts and to make them and to teach others how to make them and to conceive of them and to make them, you know, obviously co-laboring um, with mm. God um, for a particular purpose, of course. And so... Um, so much space is devoted to the detail right. of that yeah, in building. Yeah, Ezekiel and in Exodus. Right, yeah, right, right, right. And then, of course, then you have the Temple of Solomon and so forth, right? And so um, there's, there's just so much about uh, building that seems to matter. And then there's, of course, creation itself. Hmm. And, and, you know, in Job, it often uses architectural language to describe creation, right? Like hmm. the gates that hold back the mm-hmm. snow or the ice and so on, right? There's right. all these so, this sort of you know, the foundations of the earth and, mm-hmm. and all these kinds of things. Um, and so he's, you know, he's the master architect and, and, and we've been made in his image. And so mm-hmm. we have a capacity that's similar mm-hmm. um, and uh, we can put it to use for his glory. It seems to me like the way that you approach your understanding of the beauty of design is that beauty can also be functional. It's not just strictly utilitarianism versus artistry or function versus beauty. It's both. Yeah, I think I think he cares about architecture, but but then there's also, um, like for example, in Isaiah where it talks about fasting and what fasting is, mm. and the definition of fasting includes providing shelter for the poor and and includes rebuilding the waste places and us becoming restorers of the breach, mm. and so also uplifting others through what we do as builders, mm. you know, as pr- in terms of providing shelter for those in need or restoring places that have. Um, deteriorated in some way in our world and that we can use our gifts as rebuilders, so to speak, and restorers to point to the ultimate restoration. I think it, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say, between the two, I'm, I mean, in my mind, I kind of saw two halves of what you were saying there, but like the later bit that you just said was definitely a very, I guess you could say utilitarian rationale behind the value of building and architecture, it's very practical, mm-hmm. right? You you help people, you put a shelter over someone's head. Yeah. And what I'm wondering to myself is in that earlier part, you were talking about beauty and form and design and inspiration and stuff like that. And maybe this is too deep of a question for right now, but like or too vague of a question, I don't know. But I'm wondering from your point of view, as a person who thinks artistically, how do you either assign or interpret meaning from architecture? Because there's all these questions you could ask like, oh, John Lennon writes a song, imagine, what's that about? Well, it's some vague notion of peace or something like that. Right. But an instrumental piece that's a little more abstract, how do I, how do I abstract meaning from it? So the same goes for something like architecture, like it, or like the Bible plans. Like, did God have a certain meaning and yeah, for, like or, yeah. How how do you go about interpreting meaning from structure and shape and form and stuff like that? Right, that's a good question, and it's one of the more complex endeavors. So one thing that maybe is worth saying up front is architecture should probably not be about architecture. Hmm. So architecture is, you know, is intended to be about something else, right? So the tabernacle is not about the tabernacle. It's about God's way, hmm. right? And he describes that way to us hmm. in many different ways. And that building is one way in which he describes it to us. Hmm. And, and so that meaning is given in a sense to right. us for all, through all kinds of complex ways. And sometimes meaning is assigned directly by God and sometimes it's, we can infer it. Um, and of course, our culture is also assigns certain meaning to certain forms and mm. to certain ways of doing things. And so history becomes part of that. And a certain building might have a certain meaning in one place, but a different meaning in another place. Mm. Like, you know, if you think about, for example, um, something a little bit more um, sensitive, like if you think about like a, 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 a big, white, um, classical porch with very tall 
columns mm. at the end of a tree-lined road, if you looked at a building like that in the southern United States, it would have a particular meaning to right. people that's associated often with plantation homes that is associated with slavery and is associated with certain ways of life. Right. Mm. Um, whereas if you looked at that same exact building in northern Italy, it would have a different meaning right. because of the different way in which people have decided and chosen to use those buildings. And, mm. and, and so history does matter a lot, I think. Mm. And, and, and understanding people and culture that the architecture is ultimately for yeah. is a lot of what architects really have to do. And so mm. that's something that, you know, when you're learning to become an architect, um, you know, learning how to make the connection between what you do in terms of the tangible physical form and the people that you're actually serving and the life that you're trying to help enable, um, you know, that's really where it's at, right? Mm -hmm. Architecture is not about architecture. It's about, other, it's, it's about bigger things, things mm -hmm. that are more important about, than architecture. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I see it. Um, but at the same time, even though God has this incredible interest in architecture, architecture has also, you know, there's an enormous history of people using architecture towards ungodly ends. Right. Mm. And it is a constant source of temptation mm. for the maker to forget where the blessings come from mm. and to start to believe that it's you who is actually the God. Mm. Right. So like Nebuchadnezzar mm. walking on his rooftop in Babylon, right, looking over Babylon and saying, isn't this the great city that I built for my own mm. power and my own glory and so on by, with my own hands. Right. Right. And and, uh, you know, all the different examples throughout history um, that that point to that. Uh, kind of sort of self-glorification and, mm -hmm. and self-sufficiency and, and so on. Um, I guess Babel being like the ultimate, like the, the pinnacle yeah. like archetype of yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But even in, in our own faith history, like the temple in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. you know, it had a very particular purpose, but it ended up becoming confused mm -hmm. with something different. And right. it ended, instead of being about being a building that points to God's way, it became the way. Mm. Uh -huh. And 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 then suddenly the temple was the thing that was the most holy. Right. And had to be protected. And and of course, w when Christ was accused of of, of destroying the temple, and, you know, and and then rebuilding it, that's when people really started to lose it. Mm. And because it was this, the the building itself became the idol in a sense. Right. right. And so. Um, that's always been the case from the beginning of architectural history that we know that in our sinful world, um, even though God has given us this gift of being able to be architects, um, we can also choose to forget or we can be ignorant about where those blessings came from. So what are some other examples of how structures and material buildings, uh, worshiping form for form's sake, has become idolized throughout different periods of church history and what has been the outcome of this type of worship? So like when Paul is in Athens, right, in Acts 17, and he's yeah. standing there on the Areopagus and he's pointing up to the Acropolis, basically. And he's saying, you know, God doesn't need these buildings to right. dwell in, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't even realize for what purpose you have been blessed with these architectural gifts. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in the past, God winked at this ignorance, but now like is the time to repent, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so... Um, you know, St. Peter's Basilica is another really great example of a building that because people were so committed to building this building in the way that they had wanted to build it, mm -hmm. that they were willing to go to the length of selling indulgences, mm -hmm. which is what, of course, triggered the whole story with Martin Luther, right. which is, of course, what triggered the Protestant Reformation. So in a way, you could say architecture helped trigger the Protestant yeah. Reformation, because right. it was sort of a vanity project, right? That that required so much money, a, a, so much deception, yeah. and, and so much, um, you know, so so much that was contradictory to God's message of salvation. Mm -hmm. That it, it it sort of forced this reaction, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, so it's kind of interesting how both you know buildings loom large in the history of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It seems wow. both in Scripture and uh, you know after. So. It's, it's it's so interesting, you know, I see the Tower of Babel and kind of in the story that you're telling and I see even the history of art, you know, like art used to be used, you know, to point the way to the creator and, and the master builder. Uh, but when we start to worship art for the sake of art and form and symmetry and just beauty for beauty's sake, mm -hmm. it can be used for, for wrong purposes. And uh, so kind of going into like, you know, how does architecture facilitate or can it facilitate uh, 
a better relationship with God. I mean, I feel like I can walk into certain spaces or certain churches and I just feel like, oh, like this feels good. And then other places I'm like, nah, this doesn't feel so good. So how does architecture maybe facilitate a relationship? Yeah, so that's a question we ask ourselves all the time Mm -hmm. at Andrews at the School of Architecture there. And I think Christian architects everywhere ask themselves that. I think uh, one thing that's really important first is to be very honest with the limits of architecture. Mm -hmm. And of course, even within scripture, you have so many examples of people finding salvation in the worst kinds of conditions in prison. You know, so arguably a prison is one of the worst architectural (laughs) experiences that you can imagine. And people find God there. Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, like we have to be honest as architects, like architecture is not essential from like a salvation standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, architecture has like a certain power. Um, so you can, you can talk about the basics like health and wellness, for example. Mm. Um, so, you know, Ellen White talks about certain architectural strategies to make sure people stay awake just while they're worshiping and that they have fresh air mm. and that natural light is part of their condition and that you have meet basic health and safety standards so that people are alert and so that, um, in a way, you're, you're contributing towards their restoration in a physical sense, mm-hmm. right? So the environment helps to support our, our physical health and wellness, our well-being, and contributes in that way, you know, as part of a, the overall restoration efforts that we're interested in mm. um, in order to point to God and so on. Um, so that's sort of one thing. The, another thing is that architecture uh, can enable improved witnessing, um, it can be part of the, the sort of process of, of, of witnessing, um, you know, by the way that maybe either buildings look or the way they position you as an individual believer or as a group. So, like, for example, here's, here's an example. Mm-hmm. Um, in Scripture, you have the example of, of the preaching in the Solomon's porch so that the Gentiles could hear. And so there was a sort of notion that if you inhabited a certain space within the temple complex, more people could hear what you had to say. Mm. People who otherwise maybe wouldn't hear it. Right. Right. And so now you can go and as an architect, you can think about that. And you can think about how can I design a facility that actually facilitates the believers to be more effective witnesses. Mm. Now, the building on its own doesn't really do a lot of witnessing. It's just a building. Mm. But it can enable people to live a certain way in a, in a way that makes it easier, in a way that makes it more convenient and more comfortable. Um, and so I remember one time walking to church in Boston, to the Seventh-day Adventist church that's in the, in the Fenway neighborhood, mm-hmm. and um, they have an old brick church building that doesn't have air conditioning. Mm. And, and, uh, but, they have, but it's a very tall ceiling, and so it deals relatively well with the high temperatures. Mm. Um, and uh, very thick masonry walls that also prevents the heat from coming in, you know, too quickly. And so uh, they have these very tall windows. And so they open the windows in the summer to get cross ventilation going, mm. and then you can hear them singing. Mm. Mm. And so what's interesting is you can be a block away from the church and hear worship happening mm. as you're walking to church. Now, for me, as somebody who's going to that church, that's beautiful. But also for people who are just walking by. It's like a testimony. Like mm-hmm. it's Sabbath, and there's people worshiping on Sabbath, and they're happy. And they're, yeah, they're, and they're happy, right? There's yeah. joy mm-hmm. in the in the air mm-hmm. because of the way the building is pr- proximate to the street, the way that the windows are designed, the way that people have chosen to use the building in this way. And so um, these are you know all small things, obviously, mm-hmm. but uh, it's something that you know as a designer you can think about all these little things and how they add up mm-hmm. to just enabling sort of more effective witnessing. Mm-hmm. It sounds like your approach to architecture in many ways combines both beauty and function, but more than function, right? It's ministry and service towards others. In terms of, you know, how it might help you, and and you mentioned this earlier, the the verses in Isaiah that have to do with shelter for the poor Mm. and that have to do with rebuilding. Um, You know, we do this kind of thing a lot. We try to pursue those kinds of projects a lot with our students. And, And, you know, it's a, you know, if you want to um, grow closer to God, ministry, especially to those who are really in need, is one of the most effective ways mm. for you to grow closer to God. And so we're, you know, I'm interested always in how can you use architecture as a discipline to, to cultivate faith mm. within your own life by just helping other people. Through. That's cool. So, yeah. so there was like a, a shift 
uh, I'd say probably, you know, during the Protestant Reformation, right, as far as architecture is concerned, you know, we have kind of the medieval uh, European, very ornate, very kind of beautiful structures uh, of, of Catholicism. Um, and then there's kind of this shift to simplicity that happens in, within Protestantism, and, and it's carried on into the Americas. Yeah. Um, is there, like, is there a legitimate reason that that's happened? Or, I mean, as far as maybe the origin of, of some of the uh, original architectures of Catholicism that we say as Protestants that we had to move away from, because a lot of the structures are beautiful. They have beautiful paintings. They have um, just beautiful structures in general that seem to me, oh, this could really facilitate uh, worship of the Lord. But we as Protestants have tended to stray away from that. So why was that, and was it was it really necessary? Well, um, so I believe that architecture, to an extent, reflects our values mm. as individuals, but also corporately as communities. And, you know, Winston Churchill, for example, he said, we shape our buildings and afterwards they shape us. Mm. And there's this kind of back and forth relationship. Mm. And, uh, you know, Roman churches were, are physical manifestations of Roman theology. Mm. And so... In what way? So, so, for example, if you go into your standard Roman church, like I just took students to Europe and, you know, going into churches in Rome you know, the state of the dead is understood differently, right? And so Roman churches are in many ways tombs with people who are dead, mm. many of whom are to be venerated or to be um, prayed to for intercession. And so those buildings are designed for that particular purpose in part. Mm. Um, another example might be the role of the priesthood, right? And how the church sees itself as an intercessor between you and, and God and the priest has a particular role both in the ceremonies ritual of like the Eucharist and so on um, but also that the building and the whole church as an institution has the keys in a way right so that's quite literally the keys are on the church often because you know the the papacy claims to have the keys that have you know that they were supposedly given um, mm. and and so there's a certain theology that go that is behind those buildings and those buildings are expressions of that theology and they help to support that theology mm. now they're very powerful but, you know and and I would argue that um, it's it's dangerous to deny the power and the beauty of those structures mm. and, and how they help to support you know the the mission of the Roman church um, b because when you walk into these buildings, I mean, the, the, the skill level that's been put into those buildings mm. and the execution is often impeccable yeah. right. and, and very um, emotional mm. yeah. you know, and very beautiful experiences. And in fact, the entire, not just the building, but the building participates with the music, participates with the incense, the mm -hmm. smell, mm. participates with the ritual movements of what, you know, what's going on in the, in the building. Um, and so there's an entire sensory experience um, that is involved there. And so, um, you know, and in fact, I would argue that the sensory experience is really emphasized very strongly in, in Roman churches historically. If you think about either like a Gothic church where you walk in, you, you can't help but looking up and almost imagining like you're in some portal to mm. heaven, right? It right. kind of feels like that sometimes. Mm. Um, or the sensory experience of, you know, I, you know, if you go to mass somewhere, like at Notre Dame, uh, well, now that they had the spire burned down, you can't go there anymore but right. for a while. But uh, if you go to St. Peter's, for example, and you listen to the choir at St. Peter's in Rome, and, and uh, you know, even if you're not participating in Mass, you get a sense of the glory just by being in the building, mm -hmm. that event, and what an event that is, and how, you know, it's suggestive of the sort of closeness to God that is implied Mm. Um, by by that whole sensory experience, and right. so when the Reformation happened, <clears throat> you know a lot of the what the Re Reformation was about was about finding clarity, mm. right? Finding clarity in God's word mm -hmm. and restoring that clarity, mm. right? Like what is the way to God? What is the clear path? How do I connect directly? How do I find salvation? And what is the role of the church in all of this? Mm. And and you know that's what the reformers were really interested in, and so whether you're going through reformation in your own personal life or reformation of a building, you know, in a sense, you can understand why you have to sort of remove all the layers first. Like, mm -hmm. what, what are all the things that are maybe distracting me 
from my relationship with God? What are all the things that are keeping me from that direct access or keeping me from having clarity mm. about what God wants from me? Mm. And, and, and what that often means is that you have to remove the idols from your life. You have to remove all those layers that you've built up you know, in your own life, sometimes daily, mm. yeah. usually daily for me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think a church architecture went through a similar process where, mm. where because the buildings were so strongly represent, representative of a certain theology, that had in a way to be dismantled first mm. and, 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 and taken apart um, so that clarity could be rediscovered and, and, and reestablished. And so that's why you see, you know, the removal of, Statues, the removal of sculpture, mm -hmm. um, a turn to simplicity. Um, one of the things you see is you start seeing um, people getting rid of stained glass and putting in clear glass so that the light can be bright. Part of that is functional, so you can read your Bible, mm -hmm. right? So that it's bright enough to just read before electrical lighting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, part of that is also sort of symbolic of like the clarity that people were seeking, you know, whether it was the Huguenots or Methodists or, or whoever. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think it probably was necessary to go through this, this a shift mm -hmm. of some kind. Of course, there's, you know, different individuals and different denominations have different understandings of to what level that shift should take place and right. and and also um, you know at what point do you remove at what point do you uh, go towards clarity to such an extent that you've removed all of the beauty in the worship experience mm. and is, does it become now just a sort of utilitarian functional um, experience mm. um, and so yeah if it, there's going to be debate about that of course mm. too so I remember hearing um Jordan Peterson talk about this particular thing that like the ethos that kind of came with Protestantism in America was very pragmatic in how it viewed architecture and deeply suspicious of everything that had come before within Catholicism and like the medieval period. And it was like, we lost maybe in North America, this sense of like the value of beauty and mm -hmm. what that does for us and and just the the handful of ways that that can really like bring a, a people group's identity together or preserve culture or like kind of continuously imbue meaning to a people group over time even if that meaning changes so I think there's definitely something to be said about maybe what we lack in that area in that conversation yeah although I would be careful not to tie that directly to like Protestantism okay so like for example one thing I think that's important to just sort of say first is God clearly loves beauty. Sure. And so, um, you know, and that's, and he's, and he's very interested in beauty being expressed through physical things in this tabernacle and in this temple, for example, in the Old Testament. And so mm -hmm. beauty is something that God is interested in. He's interested in, in creation. It's obvious. And so um, there's that. The other thing is, is that in the history of Protestantism, like if you look at Protestant churches in New England, Mm. You know, those are often stunning, right. beautiful buildings. Now, they're a different kind of beauty. They're, you could say maybe they're often simpler. There may be, you know, some people say that they're more pure in some way. You know, a lot of times, like in New England, they're often white. And so there's this sort of mm. clarity of color to them in a way. You know, mm. that's one way of interpreting that. Sure. Or if you look at, like, the early Huguenot architecture right. in France, you know, when they were actually just developing their own building types, mm -hmm. trying to sort of come to grips um, with how do you worship in this sort of Protestant way. And they built these beautiful structures, you know, in 17th century France. Um, then, of course, they were persecuted from France and they dispersed all over Europe and the world. Mm -hmm. And some of them went to Sweden and did amazing Scandinavian Protestant architecture in, in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that, like, Protestant architecture is sort of somehow automatically sure. not interested in beauty, but... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'll concede that that as we sort of have progressed into the 21st century, more and more people are noticing that beauty seems to be not there. It seems to be missing somehow. It seems to not be um, a priority anymore, especially when it comes to worship architecture. Right. And so um, this is just my feeling about this, but my thought is that that that's more of a consequence of general cultural trends sure. in just the world mm -hmm. that increasingly we are not interested in the uh, environments of our shared experiences mm 
Mm. So like public space, civic buildings, religious right. buildings. We have no problem investing beauty into our private interiors. Right. I mean, if you look, pick up any interior design magazine or go on Pinterest or, you know, anywhere on Instagram, I mean, we are really good at beautiful private interiors. Right. We just have, we don't, we no longer prioritize that level of investment for shared experiences. Mm. Mm. And so I think that that's probably more of a consequence of our general sort of cultural trends, right. you know, with, you know, increasing disinterest in religion and, mm. and, and in community and so on, mm. you know, increasing interest in self, I suppose, right. you know, and so, um, so I, I think that, that that's something that's important to say because I wouldn't want to somehow imply that Protestantism automatically is, is somehow a less beautiful architecture. Sure, and you, you take a visit to any Anglican church and that that thesis would be very well um, justified for sure. Well, and even in early Adventist churches, like, okay, so if you go to like the first Adventist church in Washington, New Hampshire, right? Like that's a really simple box building, but it's an elegant box. Mm -hmm. It's like a really well-tailored box, right. you know, beautiful proportions, nice little thing, you know, and it was, you know, it was a modest building for a rural community, a small rural, rural community. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to, you know, later Adventist church architecture around the United States, um, like the Dime Tabernacle in Battle Creek, I mean, that was a pretty spectacular Victorian, you know, riot sort of mm. building. It was like a really pretty stunning mm. building. And uh, and so, um, you know, for Ellen White, for example, she, you know, she really cautions us to not um, present our faith as something that is gloomy. Right. And she really emphasizes the need for joy mm. to be a part of our expression of faith. And, and when it comes to like the way we dress, we're supposed to be, you know, neat and, and, and well put together, but not ostentatious, right. but, but still express joy in the way we, the way, way we live. And so, mm -hmm. and so she says similar things about uh, the interiors of, of churches, for example, and that, that in cheerful rooms, the need for cheerful rooms mm -hmm. um, in our institutions. Mm -hmm. And so um, joy is part of the beauty experience. And, and so if you, if you, if you start to wander too far into, you know, sort of utilitarian sort of dimension that can be lost. Hmm. And, and so then you have to ask yourself, like, is that a good idea? Is that the best way for us to be stewards of our resources is if our buildings don't express joy hmm. in any kind of way? Um, if we can afford to make them express joy, if right. we're willing to invest joy into our own private homes, but not into our church buildings. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a, a thing to think about. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation on the history of sacred space and the theology that is often behind the designs. I look forward to continuing our conversation with Andrew Von Mauer next week as we look at some of the more modern applications of what we talked about today. If you are not already following us on Instagram and Facebook, you can find us at the handle at AdventNext. And if you have any personal questions of your own that you'd like for us to address, please feel free to write us at our website, adventnext.com. Thanks again to our guest, Andrew Von Maurer, and thanks again to the Adventist Learning Community for making this program possible. Once again, I'm your host, Kendra Arsenal. See you next week.